as the clock ticks closer to midnight on the 30th of April, 2004, thousands of people stream towards Piłsudski Square in Warsaw. Men, women and children, all wrapped up in hats and gloves to keep out the cold, are coming together in the dead of night to mark a moment in history. As they proudly wave their flags, their president addresses the nation. The door of Poland is open to Europe now. This is a historic day for us. And we will do everything not to disappoint everybody. On the stroke of midnight, fireworks erupt. And alongside the Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovakia, Lithuania, Slovenia, Latvia, Estonia, Cyprus and Malta, Poland joins the European Union. Overnight, millions of people were given the right of freedom of movement. And soon, hundreds of thousands of Poles had come to the UK, where they boosted the workforce and reshaped everyday life. Polish beer, Polish sausage, Polish baby food. Across the road, you can get a Polish haircut. This is the very heart of Polish Southampton. While in 2016, estimates suggested that there were up to 1.3 million Polish people living in Britain, today, the number has shrunk by a quarter of a million. Brexit was certainly a key factor uh, behind the departure of so many Poles, but by no means the only one. I just assumed it was all to do with Brexit, but it's not. So why are so many Poles leaving? And what does it mean for the Britain they leave behind? I cannot go on because I've got no staff to wash up or serve afternoon teas. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, where did all the polls go? I'm Matthew Campbell, the Foreign Features Editor at the Sunday Times. Matthew, in all your years at the Sunday Times, you've covered so much of the world as a foreign correspondent and a foreign features writer. Take us back to the start of this story. How did you become so interested in Poland? Yes, well, I have been around quite a bit, but now I live in Hampshire and I was walking along the river one day, the River Test, uh, with my wife. And we met this young woman called Alexander Oleznik. And it turned out that she had been recruited by the National Trust as the first female riverkeeper on a particular part of the River Test. And we started chatting and it turned out that she is Polish, having arrived in the UK when she was 15 with her parents and decided to stay. And we were discussing the reports that we'd both heard about how many people from Poland had been leaving the country in the wake of Brexit. These reports that up to a quarter of a million people had left since 2016. And I was interested in finding out more about that. It just seemed like so many people to to leave in a few years. And I wanted Mm. to find out what was going on. So how how did you go about doing that? How do you go about sort of um, finding enough of the Polish community to find out what's actually happening? It turns out that wherever you go in this country, you will come across Polish people. And in the village I live in, there are certainly people who are descended from Polish immigrants from the 19th century even. But also in far removed places like the Orkney Islands, there are Poles living there. And so it's not that difficult to find polls to talk to about this. And a little search on Google led me to the Polish-British Integration Centre in Bedford, a city I had never visited before. And I met a wonderful woman called Malgorzata Brady, otherwise known as Mags. 
her family had a long history in this country, starting with her grandfather, who came over during the Second World War, and he had fought for Britain in the war. Her father grew up in England, was born in Halifax. But then they moved back to Poland. The father, as a young man, got involved with the Solidarity Movement in Gdansk. Millions of Poles organized themselves in the Solidarność Movement, fighting for freedom and democracy under an authoritarian regime. This worker activism turned into an anti-communist opposition movement. It was a, a movement led by Lech Wałęsa in the shipbuilding union against the communist government. When the solidarity movements uh, started, he was quite involved in it. I know that definitely we had leaflets in our warehouse <laughs> that weren't quite legal. <laughs> and so her father came back to the UK after being persecuted by the communist regime over his political affiliations and settled down in Bedford. We had this book um, uh, at the grammar school where, where we had the maps of Britain, for example, the map of London. And our imagination yeah. was full of how Britain should look like. But when I, you know, came out of the plane, it, it kind of started to look a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was how MAGS came to be working there for this Polish-British integration group. I mean, what's really interesting in that story is that you realise that a lot of people started talking about Poles in this country in 2004 when there was this wave of migration into Britain. But actually, the history goes back much, much, much longer. Give us a sense of when were the first sort of waves of Polish immigration into Britain and what have been the key points when they cropped up? Well, yes, you're right. There have been several waves of Polish immigration to the UK. And I suppose the biggest was in the Second World War, when I think up to 200,000 Poles arrived in this country, fleeing the Nazis. And then in the communist era that followed, similarly, there were people being persecuted who came here to find safety in exile. But in 2004, the floodgates really opened. And just remind us of what happened in 2004, why it suddenly became such a destination for Polish people. Well, 2004 was when Poland joined the EU, along with 10 other mainly Eastern and Central European countries. Again, Ursula, we're welcoming 10 new member states into the European Union. And today marks a new beginning for Europeans. I extend a hand of friendship. And Britain was one of a few countries in the EU that decided to open the borders to them straight away. You have to remember that in 2004, the British economy was booming. And so we needed immigrant labour. And suddenly there were no barriers. And this brought about a very rapid change where people could just pack their bags and come to the UK. Britain, for Polish people, represented a land of opportunity because at that time, one in five Poles were unemployed. And so they were desperate for jobs. Britain was desperate to have them here. And so everyone was happy. I remember that moment. And I remember sort of all of the little Polish shops that would start to crop up. How did they settle in? How did society sort of change as this wave of immigration came in? Well, at first, Poles were taking up menial jobs. And you may remember the term Polish plumber, which became shorthand for cheap immigrant labour. But of course, it wasn't just mending pipes that they were engaged in. You know, they were doing all sorts of jobs. They came with children and families, like my friend the riverkeeper on the test. And they created tightly knit communities, Polish shops and churches and clubs. And they became the largest non-UK-born immigrant community in the country, making Polish essentially the second language in Britain. And they became quite integral to British society. And Matthew, do we have a sense of what that meant in numbers? Do we know roughly how many Poles actually moved to the UK? Well, the statistics are somewhat contradictory. The Office of National Statistics, for instance, estimates that there were 900,000-odd Poles living in Britain in 2016. And then in the wake of Brexit, that started to go down. And it's now estimated that 
the number is under 700,000, 691,000. However, the former Polish ambassador to the UK I met in Warsaw, he thought that there were probably many more Poles living in Britain in 2016, as many as 1.3 million. And he thought that over 300,000 had left, not just to return to Poland, but to go to other countries as well in other parts of Europe. From all the discussions you've had, why were so many people keen to leave or keen to return to Poland? What changed for them? Well, I think Brexit was certainly a key factor uh, behind the departure of so many Poles, but by no means the only one. Brexit, for some, was the perfect excuse to say to themselves, oh, well, they don't want us anymore. We might as well go. Because a lot of people originally came here thinking that they wouldn't stay forever. They just wanted a job. I spoke to a young woman called Dominika Paulik, who actually teaches English at the Polish-British Integration Centre in Bedford. And she came to the UK with her family. Her father had worked in a recycling plant and her mother as a cleaner. My dad was an RE teacher. Right. in Poland, but with like cuts to education and things like that, you know, his hours were cut so much that it, you know, it wasn't a sustainable option for him. So he met somebody in a prayer group who said, look, I, I am thinking of going to England. And dad said, well, you know, I've got two little kids, um, you know, not enough hours at the school. It's mm. kind of our only option. At first, she recalled being very unhappy in school because she didn't understand a word of what they were saying to her, but she was a quick student and learned English fluently. And she decided that she wanted to stay in the UK. Her father was determined to go back, and he had always been intending to go back, and Brexit was the perfect excuse for him. His, his whole thing was, I don't need to be a part of the culture. I don't need to be a part of the community. I'm just here for work, for the money, and I'm out of here. Right. And then just as year and year went on, we became part of the culture. We became part of the community yeah. as the kids, you know. And so he went with his wife and three of Dominica's siblings. And she's in touch with them, obviously, and the father keeps on asking when she's going to return, but she says that she doesn't want to. And some of her siblings feel as though they may be missing out on things in the UK. My siblings love England. They would come here. Like, mm. If it wasn't for the Brexit, I'm sure my sister would be here studying, I'm sure. They would want to come back if it wasn't for Brexit, which has now made it nearby impossible. Uh, you have to have quite a well-paid job, and the visa is very expensive. It's usually paid for by the prospective employer. So you can't just turn up looking for work. It's a huge change. So there are changes that Brexit causes on the bureaucratic side of life. It's much harder to stay. There's a lot of form filling. What about culturally? Did things shift? Well, what prompted some people also to leave in the wake of Brexit was the feeling of alienation, perhaps. Some people told me about this. The mood soured in the run-up to Brexit and in, in the wake of it. A lot of people got very riled up. I spoke to one woman in Warsaw, Karolina Vatras, who is the head teacher at a school there, who had lived in Cambridge, had studied in Cambridge, and had ended up becoming an academic. And she told me that, you know, in the run-up to Brexit, she would, for instance, get into a taxi and people would ask her, you know, where she was cleaning, because it was assumed that if you were Polish and a woman, you were likely to be a cleaner. And I guess if you were a man, you were likely to be a plumber, you know. In everyday life, I think, uh, a little bit, uh, there was an assumption that uh, if you were uh, Polish, you were somehow exploiting uh, the system. There were examples of people being abused verbally and even physically, particularly Eastern Europeans, and it got very ugly. Even though I would consider myself as actually uh, part of British culture at that point, I, I, did, I did find it uh, extremely uh, alienating, actually. And I think for some, yes, certainly that was the motivating factor, prompting them to say, oh, well, let's, let's get out of here, basically. It's, it's depressing to hear that those things were happening. Yes. 
I can see why that would make some people want to leave, and clearly that's what's happened with Carolina. Have there been other triggers during this period since the Brexit? We've also had the pandemic. How, how did that play out? Yeah, I think the pandemic perhaps had an even greater impact and was a bigger factor in the number of Poles who left because people kept on telling me that they're very family-oriented. And so a lot of people, when the pandemic struck, wanted to go home to their families, perhaps to help look after their parents. And certainly that was a big consideration for them. And I think what may have happened too is that when they got home, as it were, or when they returned to their native country, they discovered it was you know, much different from the one they left behind. In the years since 2004, Poland has been basically booming. Poland now has become perhaps the new land of opportunity with a profusion of jobs and booming tech sector. If you remember, Keir Starmer said in Parliament not so long ago, Mr. Speaker, after 13 years of Tory failure, the average family in Britain will be poorer than the average family in Poland by 2030. He said that's a shameful state of affairs, but I don't think the Poles consider it to be particularly shameful. Coming up, how did Poland become such a booming economy? And what does the exodus of Polish people mean for Britain? That's in just a moment. Matthew, you talked about Poland now, which sounds like it's booming. Just give us a sense of what the country is like and some of its history, why its recent boom has sort of come almost as a surprise. Well, Poland, which came into life in the 10th century, became a very prosperous, powerful, large country that was eventually partitioned between Germany, Austria and Russia. And it didn't sort of become Poland again within its own borders until 1918. And then, of course, the 20th century was particularly violent and devastating for Poland as it was overrun by Russia, Germany, uh, and then later the communist takeover, which had a huge impact on the way the country developed afterwards. So that left the Polish economy in particular in quite a bad state. How have things turned around since then? Well, joining the EU was what turned the country around. And that process since 2004 has been quite impressive to behold with this regular growth rate of 4% a year and real income going through the roof compared to what it was in 2004. In other words, they have a very well-developed economy. In 2004, one in five people were unemployed. Now it's definitely an employment market. And Matthew, you went to Warsaw to look into this piece. Just give us a sense of what it's like now. Yes, the first time I went was over a decade ago, actually. And uh, I remember there's been a big change since then, because at the time, I seem to recall, there was one building dominating the skyline, which was this vast Stalinesque wedding cake shaped building of the sort you see in (laughs) Moscow this very gaunt sort of foreboding architecture. Now it's been joined by a whole host of other gleaming glass and metal buildings of the sort you see on the London skyline. And that's a big change. I mean, it sounds like Warsaw, rather like the Polish economy, has been completely transformed. And you can see why people are being lured back. Tell us about some of the people you've spoken to who've who've made that switch, who've gone from Britain back to Poland. Yes, I spoke to a young woman called Agnieszka Uba, who had a pretty high-flying job at Google after studying in this country, and then she went off to Ireland. 
returned to Poland after getting an invitation to join a startup in the AI sector, effectively, the high tech uh, sector. This is obviously a booming area now. It was interesting what she said about how the change in the time that she'd been away, that living standards had increased quite spectacularly. I was visiting the parents of my friends from the UK. I was like then calling back my parents like, wow, do you know that every single mom of my friends, they have a Louis Vuitton bag? This is the standard here that they, they have, you know, designer bags. Before she went, her mother, for instance, would never have had a designer handbag or her friends in Poland, their their mothers never did. Well, now, 10 years later, most of my friends in Poland have designer bags. But now they do and they all go on holidays to the Dominican Republic and so forth. The quality of living Mm. is 10 times better than 10 years ago. So lo- lots of the signs, you know, very physical signs of success. And it's interesting because while Poland seems to be booming, in the meantime, since 2004, when Britain was booming, more recently, things haven't been going so well. Is this just that the standard of living is now better in Poland than it is here? Well, I think that in some ways you could probably say that it is. Some of the people I spoke to while discussing the reasons they left Britain would talk about particularly the housing issues. One person in particular who said his friends would visit from Poland and say, you've got to be kidding, are you living here? (laughs) So so in some ways, I think, yes, life in Warsaw might seem more appealing with better living conditions. And basically, it's a lot cheaper. And yet, while it seems to be doing very well economically and has done since it joined the EU, it hasn't been plain sailing politically. Tell us a bit about the politics and how its relations with the EU have gone up and down in that period. Yes, you're right. The Law and Justice Party effectively is the government, won a parliamentary majority in 2015, and was re-elected in 2019. It's very right wing. And relations with the EU have become really quite tense and strained of late. A top court ruled that some Polish laws have priority over the European Union laws. The European Commission expressed, quote, serious concerns over the ruling, while the opposition in Poland warned of the possibility of the country leaving the 27-nation bloc. There was widespread protest among a younger generation of people. You know, they feel that they're part of Europe. But it's also been criticized for a crackdown on the media, trying to control the judiciary and stamping out LGBT rights. While Poland seems to be booming, certainly doing far better than it was before, the standard of living is going up. We've had Brexit and there was the pandemic, which again seems to have caused people to go back. What effect is that having on Britain? I think it's created difficulties in some areas. There is a shortage of workers in various sectors. It's a big issue from hospitality to farming to care workers in the NHS. Britain's economic recovery is being held back by labour shortages. The latest to highlight them, the big business group, which reports gaps from farmers' fields to shop and factory floors. 50,000 more people are leaving than are, than are coming in from the EU. And that has been offset, though, to a large extent by people coming in from countries such as Nigeria, Zimbabwe, the Philippines. So this is a completely new picture of immigration in this country. And yet, even though there are still people coming in from elsewhere in the world, it does feel like there are patches of industry where they're not finding enough people to recruit, particularly we keep hearing the hospitality sector, for example. Tell us what you found there. Well, yes, that was one of the places I started because just down the road from where I live is Highclere Castle. And I had a chat with Lady Carnarvon, the lady of the house who had complained in an article that she wrote for The Independent about how difficult it was to find anyone to serve afternoon teas at Highclere. And also she'd had to basically put an end to the wedding business that she had been running there for years because she had depended very heavily on young workers from EU countries who were sometimes studying at the University of Southampton. They were at university and they you know, wanted to earn some money. 
And now if they're there, they have to fill in a 30-page form. And who's going to do that then? And now that's all stopped. And so she made the point that if they want to come, they have to fill in all these forms and pay for expensive visas. And she said, you know, who's going to do that? It's not viable. I cannot go on because I've got no staff to wash up or serve afternoon teas. And what about the highly skilled sectors in particular? I mean, has there been a bit of a brain drain? Are we losing potential people who could be of great help to the British economy? Well, I mentioned Carolina Vatras, who is the head teacher at this very prestigious high school in Warsaw. They basically follow the UK curriculum. And there's been a slight change, though, since Brexit, and that is that EU students are now, of course, overseas students. And whereas before they would pay maybe 9000 a year for a university education in this country, it's now anything from 24000 25000 upwards. And she made the point that if you're going to pay this money, you might be more inclined to apply to an American university I can already see that some of the best students in this year will be going to the US. If you're prepared to pay that kind of money, you might as well go to the US, where you will have more international students around you. And so she thought that this was going to be a significant loss for Britain. Uh, The UK uh, are actually uh, losing the brightest, some of the brightest Mm. students from Poland. And now they will be less inclined to do so. So that could represent a significant loss for us, was her argument. Matthew, altogether, you know, having looked at this, having spoken to so many Polish people, having gone to Warsaw as well as seen the impact here, does this spell the end of the British-Polish love affair? I don't think so. And nobody I spoke to thought so either, because our relationship is so historic and deep. And I think that everyone will remember the Polish pilots who fought so bravely in the Second World War. We've always, I think, very much appreciated the Poles. And I think this feeling is mutual. And I think, though, that many people go back and forth and will try to continue to do so wherever possible. And so I think certainly the relationship will continue. Do you think there's a possibility that the tidal wave may reverse, where it's not just that Poles and Poles will want to go back? Are we going to reach a point where we find British people going over to Poland looking for jobs? Well, do you know what? I I think that that would certainly have been a possibility were it not for Brexit, because obviously we don't have that freedom of movement now. And so young people, obviously they can visit Poland, but they can't just go there and start looking for jobs. I do think there are a lot of jobs going in Poland and Warsaw particularly is a very appealing city in so many ways. But I I think basically just because, you know, we're not free to go and work in European countries anymore, it's unlikely to happen. But it might have done. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, the Foreign Features Editor for The Sunday Times, Matthew Campbell. You can find all of Matthew's work at thetimes.co.uk with a subscription or in print on Sundays. The producer today was Charlotte Alt. The executive producer is Kate Ford, and sound design was by David Crackles. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow.